Thank you once again for everyone joining us today for our Acumon webinar, Market Insights. What does the Russian-Ukraine conflict mean for markets? So today I'm the moderator. My name is Caroline York. Um, some of you guys might have seen me around before, but I'm the head of co corporate communications here at Acumon. And our speakers are esteemed Dr. Arthur Lay, chief economist and lead quantitative researcher of Acumon. So without further ado, uh, let's hop right in. So just a bit of background, uh, get everybody on the same page. Uh, if you haven't heard of Acumon, we're a wealth tech or a wealth, digital wealth management app. So we're here to help you make smarter, simpler, and more accessible investments, especially in times of such volatility. What we aim to do is to give you long-term mm -hmm. stable growth with your wealth. Um, now, if you guys want to check us out, feel free to download us on the app. Uh, there's going to be an email send out later anyway. So there's some little rewards and discounts for you to try out our app and see how that we can help you grow your wealth. So first off, let, let's talk about the agenda of today's talk. So we're going to have an overview of the war, and I'm sure a lot of you guys are interested uh, and maybe keeping up to date. So we'll talk a little bit more about, you know, the overview, what's happening with Russia's market, and more importantly, how does this affect uh, us, right? How does it affect investors? We'll look at the macroeconomic outlooks um, in terms of globally, you know, just because we're focused on war right now, what else should we be looking into? And we'll also look into certain risks and effects and how your portfolio is going to do in this kind of climate. Uh, towards the end, we will have some key takeaways in case uh, people have been joining late, uh, you get the summary there. And also we will have a Q&A session. Um, so let's leave all the questions to the back. We will be able to see your questions if you pop them into the Q&A uh, conversation button, uh, and we'll do our best to try to reply to as many questions as possible. So thank you. Now, to the Russia-Ukraine war, that really is a conflict that started out, um, I would say the war itself broke out quite abruptly, but actually it's been uh, running politically in the background, the tensions and the conflict um, a while back, actually, since the uh, mid 2000s, I would say. So one of the Lord, Europe's largest world war, let's just say not world war, but largest war since World War II. Uh, it happened obviously on February 24th of, uh, well, last month now, and Russia launched a full-scale military invasion of Ukraine. As people can see, you know, there's a lot of refugees coming out. There's been over 1.6 million refugees now uh, leaving Ukraine and seeking asylum in other European countries. And obviously that's going to bit, put a little bit of uh, infra pressure on the infrastructures of other European uh, countries. Now, uh, ultimately their demand is for NATO to stop expanding and moving the borders back to where they were in 1997. So Russia just wants to keep NATO away from them. And uh, unfortunately, you know, we're just, this is a terrible, terrible situation and our heart and prayers go out to all the uh, Ukrainians and Russians who are affected by this war. Uh, but most likely though, this war shouldn't last too long, not in the modern day and age, because A, cost, the cost of war is very, very high and very expensive. And ultimately, actually nobody really wants to see this uh, war get prolonged. So that's a quick overview of the Ukraine war. Currently, Russia is uh, facing around about, I think, 2,500 so sanctions, uh, making it one of the most sanctioned countries in the world. So things uh, have to change, and this is what we're looking into. So let's go into uh, the Russia's market. So uh, Dr. Lay, over to you. Can you tell us a little bit more about what's happening in Russia's market specifically? So for Russia, um, hi everybody. Thank you very much. So for Russia, I, uh, the Russian index actually dropped over thirty-five um, percent after the after the invasion, and we can see that uh, Russia's ruble has already dropped over thirty percent against the USD. But I think the most important thing for us to, to look at is um, the impact of Ru the, uh, Russia and the Ukraine war against the, the impact on the uh, global markets. So as we can see that uh, yesterday um, for the third round of uh, um, the, the negotiation broke up and the market actually down a lot. I, I remember that S&P 500 uh, not last night uh, dropped uh, around 
uh, 3%, and for NASDAQ, he dropped around 3.6%. It's very, very volatile at the moment. And, you know, uh, I mean, this here on our notes, it's also saying, you know, a lot of different indexes have dropped Russia altogether, right? And would this actually impact any of, um, I guess, what's happening with what we're investing in at the moment? Um, no, actually, for, uh, you mean for Acumos investors, right? Yes, because we do invest into a lot of indexes and seeing that, you know, all these other MSCIs, S&P, they're removing Russia. You know, how, how, how do you feel about this in terms of the effect on our current so, stock holdings? Yeah, the, the impact for, for our investors is actually uh, limited because our exposure to Russia's uh, securities is very low. Uh, for mm -hmm. example, we only have two way for our S SGM and SGU products, we only invested in two index ETFs that have exposure to Russia. One is VWO, which is the emerging market, um, which tracks the MSCI uh, emerging market index. And uh, now I think um, Russia has already been dropped out of this index. And, uh, 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 and the, also the weight for VWO is very low in our SG, SGM and SGU series products. And uh, uh, also another one is EMB, which invested in the, uh, in the emerging market bond. And uh, the exposure to Russia is very, very low for this index. And we also have a very restricted or a very low weight for this uh, ETF. Therefore, I think the, um, the direct exposure to Russia is uh, mm. limited. Right, got it. And what about this whole situation right now where we're talking about basically the financial systems kind of uh, closing down in on Russia, right? Uh, international banking systems, SWIFT, Visa, MasterCard, they're all suspending operations. What kind of implications can we see in the bigger market? Um, so there are, I think there are three, may, mainly there are three types of impact from, from this type of sanctions. The first one is the, uh, the type of uh, risk appearance, risk appetite, or risk preference uh, is much lower than than the pre-war pre-war period. Now we know that the, the market actually has a very strong fear against this war, and uh, uh, each round of negotiation broke up, and the market would drop a nut. Therefore, this is the first part from the impact, and the second second one is um, the kind of um, I should say that the supply chain from Russia, because we know that the, uh, the uh, around 10% of the global um, oil and gas is actually um, provided by Russia. And uh, now the market is actually uh, fear about um, if about the cut or the um, decline in the supply of oil and gas due to the um, cut down of the uh, SWIFT or the other kind of financial system restrictions. For example, if um, we, we know that for Iran in 2014, after, the, after Iran was whipped out of, wiped out of uh, SWIFT system, the, in, in 2015 and 2016, the oil production and the exportation for uh, for Iran dropped um, around 50% each year. Therefore, uh, also the market is fear for the same situation for Russia. Hmm. So I think we touched upon it just a little bit. So I'm gonna move on to the next slide where we can ask like, so what does this mean, right? All the sanctions, uh, drops in market, what does it actually mean for the global markets itself? Yes, actually, uh, as I mentioned, we have three points. Ma major, there are three, three impacts from this Russia-Ukraine war to the global markets. The first one is the risk preference. And the second one is about the oil and gas and the other supply chain issue. And the third one would be the kind of um, import and export for the, I, I mean, for, for the, uh, for the Euro European countries, because for most of the Euro com European countries, they depend a lot on the raw materials imported from 
uh, Russia. Therefore, uh, if there is a kind of shutdown, uh, shutdown of the uh, transactions between Russia and the European countries, um, I think there is there are some some type of uh, longer term issue for for those countries. For example, we know that for uh, Czech and uh, Hungary, they rely on the um, energy and uh, the type of mining, um, th these type of uh, raw material products or the or the machineries from Russia. Uh, they the they import around like uh, the seventy percent of their import in these these type of sectors are from Russia. Therefore, I think this is a kind of a longer term Im impact on these countries. And uh, um, we we should see what what will be the impact on the on the other countries. For example, for the United States and the other North American countries, actually the direct impact is very small because uh, for for uh, the United States, um, they do not import as much as material as much materials as the European countries do. And uh, for China, we uh, we import a little bit uh, of the materials for the build, the beauty materials from Russia. And uh, for the other APEC countries, I think the impact is also limited. Therefore, the most in, most uh, impacts are on the European countries. Right. So I think the, the, the big overview would be the fact that Europe would be taking more of a hit than actually the rest of the, the world in this sense. Um, yes. Okay. So let's look into perhaps um, the macro overview right now. Uh, other things that we should be paying attention to uh, apart from just the war and, its, uh, and, and what's happening in the war in itself. Um, I think the first one is the red hike. We should be we should pay attention to red hike. As our last sem our last webinar, we talk about the economic outlook for twenty twenty two, and we uh, we mentioned that red hike should be a very important issue for the global uh, market in two uh, twenty twenty two. And um, now there is there is much more uncertainty for red hike because. Um, the reason for Fed to conduct a rate hike is that is is due to the uh, high inflation, the very high inflation now, and a uh, strong uh, economic fun uh, fundamentals for for the United States. And now, as you can see, that the fundament the fundamental issues for the United States macroeconomic situation is still good. We know that for last week. Uh, on Friday, actually, the unemployment the the unemployment rate um, keeps uh, drop and uh, dropping, and uh, we know that the non farm payrolls is uh, was good for February. And uh, um, however, um, I think this Russia Ukraine uh, war um, just introduced more uncertainty. A more uncertainty to this rate hike because uh, Fed may be may be fear of the economic of some type of economic slowdown due to this war. Therefore, the uh, rate hike, for example, for uh, for March actually before the war, the market as anticipated um, a fifty basis point rate hike, and after after the war, now we the market expected uh, 25 uh, basis point rate hike, and uh, the Fed is also um, com and kind of committed, orally committed, that they only have a 25 uh, basis point rate hike in, in March. However, as we can see that the situation is still bad for, for, the, for the inflation because the inflation will persist longer than the market's expectations. Um, pre, the pre war expectations due to uh, so the uh, energy supply chain issues and also the other type of the uh, import and export transactions issues for the European countries. Therefore, the situation, the inflation situations is not good for the United States. However, the Fed cannot uh, have a 
a strong or a massive rate hike in March. Therefore, I think there is a very, very high uncertainty for the future rate hike. Because mm. if, if the war um, if the war ends in the near term, therefore, I I I, I will I, I guess that I I expect that uh, Fed will have a massive rate hike after afterwards to um, stop the inflation because mm. for for February wait I think the markets expect anticipated that the inflation rate will be over eight oh, wow. percent and. Um, yeah, and uh, the third issue for the uh, for the macroeconomic um, outlook is is the weaponization and the politicization for the of fi financial system or the uh, for example we can see that swift swift system is now taken uh, is now taken as a type of sanction tool for the for for the United States and the the European countries and. Uh, uh, this is not a good issue because uh, once we weapon, weaponize this type of financial system, that will be a kind of breaking down of the patterns of the breaking down of the of these kind of collaborations between countries. So mm. this is not a good issue. I think what what is quite interesting um, that you've mentioned is actually on the oh the fact that the 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 war has been so prominent and forward in the news you know the underlying part of it is the fact that there is still a lot of consequences from the pandemic since 2019 hence inflation is going you know crazy and off the charts at eight percent and you know the economies are still trying to recover from unemployment they're still trying to recover to grow and so the rate hike is definitely something um all investors globally should be uh, attuned to whereas as you were talking about the weaponization and politicization of finance uh for sure i think i've read some news you know it's it's saying this gives a lot of signals to non-Western countries about whether or not you should buy into the system such as Visa, such as SWIFT, such as MasterCards, all of these payment networks, because if a country or if a coalition of countries decide to uh, put a lot of sanctions on you, this is what happens. And I think it makes an interesting argument also for a lot of those in the crypto space and the digital asset space saying this is why decentralized finance has two legs to stand on at this point. Yes, I agree on that. We we need some type of decentralization um, system around the world to to have the uh, countries to be getting into this type of system to uh, collaborate with each other and the time protect themselves in this type of system. Uh, but one thing is that I I I guess this right now the cryptocurrencies are uh, they depend. They depend too much on the liquidity from the United States or from the global central banks. Therefore, uh, they, they, their type of uh, effects are limited right now. Mm. I think we're going to hop onto that topic about the risk and effects um, through our investment outlooks. And I think we will plug that right in. So um, during our, our pre-call, we were discussing, you know, what are the risks and effects for investors, right? And just as you were talking about cryptocurrency, tell us again why the cryptocurrency might not necessarily perform so well in the near term uh, due to the situation, the global ma macroeconomic situation. Uh, I guess I guess there are two. Um, actually, the most important reason, as I as I mentioned, cryptocurrencies depends depend too much on the liquidity from the global central banks, and uh, as we can see that right now. Um, the uh, Fed and other Western countries, central banks, are now in the in a trend of rate hikes and uh, um, balance sheet runoff. Therefore, the liquidity to to the cryptocurrency markets can be uh, can be shrinking, and uh, their performance cannot be as good as in the past ten years. And uh, also, we can see that inflation right now. The inflation is actually a uh, uh, not a near term uh, or a, a short term issue. Actually, um, inflation can be a long term issue bothering the global economies in the next maybe 10 years due to uh, several issues, the near term, these type of uh, supply chain issues. And in the, in the future, 
the energy issues and uh, the carbon um, pro, uh, the kind of carbon um, cut down movements. These all these issues can affect inflation and uh, now. The, therefore, the I think the regime for for cryptocurrencies is changed due to this type of um, this non longer term inflation issue. Yeah, we see that obviously S and P most of the stocks have actually gone downwards. Um, I think I mentioned here on the slides, the bond markets are not looking very optimistic either. Uh, whereas people are actually flocking towards, let's say, property, and they're flocking towards commodities. Can we talk a little bit about that? Uh, so for properties, because properties is a, actually is a kind of um, inflation protection uh, asset. Therefore, people during hyperinflation, people tend to buy more properties. And for uh, for for the commodities, as we know that this uh, one of the one of the uh, cause or the one of the reason for the hyperinflation right now is due to the, the supply chain shortage and uh, uh, which is which is enhanced by the by the uh, Russian Ukraine war therefore I think for for the near term for for example for the next few months uh, commodities can can still be strong and um, um, Hello, can everybody else hear me? Are we going through some connectivity issues? Ooh, sorry about that. A little bit of a technical difficulty we're having at the moment. Um, we're gonna wait until Dr. Lei comes back up, but I think we can also look a little bit into um, what this means. We were just saying that the bond markets are not doing too well. And the fact that, you know, commodity is actually still on the rise. Now, one of the questions I had for Dr. Lei was whether or not the commodity market currently is a little bit overheated. So I would like him to answer that once he's back in. But here's a little bit of a filler situation. If you look to the graph to the right at the moment, you'll see that actually the S&P 500 has fallen down the lowest it's been in the past century. So you can even see it's actually currently in the drawdown is negative 5%. Um, and you can see through all the different uh, global, um, I guess, happenings, right? What this actually means for the market. Um, now. Dr. Lei, are you back with us? Oh, we, we can't hear you yet. Mm. Nope. <laughs> All right. Um, we'll wait until Dr. Lei fixes uh, the, the connectivity issue here. But let me now move on to the next slide. So we were actually discussing uh, what to do in this kind of strange climate that we see ourselves in. It's a super volatile place. Commodities are going off the charts. You know, stocks are cratering. So what can we do to protect our assets? Now, we're going to give you a little bit of a look through of our current Acumon portfolios. Um, some of you who are invested with Acumon, you'll realize that our investment um, policies have always been, let's look at the long-term stable growth, right? We're looking at um, diversifying all of our different assets and putting uh, money in different pockets and different um, kind of uh, groups 
of things you can buy <laughs> in for a simpler way of saying things. Now, on the top, you will see, you will see our Smart Global Max versus the MSCI in a six months performance. So again, MSCI has dropped to eight negative 8.99%, whereas the Acumon portfolio has been weathering this volatility with only a negative percent of 2.32. Um, this just shows that if you don't put all of your eggs in one basket, generally speaking, your portfolio is going to be much safer, much, uh, much less risk adverse, uh, I'm sorry, much less risk uh, taking on. And so what you can do is you can leverage on that. And when the whole global market crashes, you will actually sink a little, little bit less. Now, on the other hand, if you look at our Smart Global Ultimax, so that product came out round about, I believe it was uh, June. Um, now, when Smart Global Ultimax came through, you can see the performance as well with the MSCI and the six months performance. The drop is much greater. Now, the reasoning for this compared to maybe Smart Global Max is because we have a lot of hedging um, algorithms that go into it. So it's a much smarter um, system, much smarter portfolio that does smart exchanges. It will actually discretionary, uh, discretionarily help you rotate. It's got much more stock holdings as well. So um, in a sense, it can help you achieve greater outperformance when the markets are doing well, but also when the markets are not doing as well, it is actually higher on the risk that you will suffer a bigger loss. Now, that being said, currently you can see that the MSCI holding uh, approximately the same asset classes has dropped to around about negative 11.48%, whereas our portfolio has actually just dropped by 5.65%, right? So in that, that way, you can see even in the aspect that we have a very aggressive portfolio, we can still manage the risk a lot better, okay? Uh, so if you guys are interested in checking this out, feel free to... Uh, look through it on your app or, you know, reach out to some of our customer service and they're more than happy to discuss this with you. Dr. Lei, is your sound system back on? Yes. Can you hear me now? Perfect. Perfect. So I was just saying, you know, we're seeing that commodities are skyrocketing, right? Is this commodities market just a little bit overheated at the moment? So how should we look into this? Uh, I guess for the commodity markets is, um, yes, Heated, but it's, not, it's still not overheated right now because we have uncertainties for the for the global um, energy supplies, and we also have the uh, supply chain issues due to the COVID nineteen, which is not solved uh, right now. Therefore, I I believe that the commodities can be still good for the next one one or two quarters, and uh, after the after the Russian Ukraine war and uh, also the um, the end of COVID nineteen pandemic, I think uh, we can have better we uh, we will have better supply chain and uh, the commodity price will um, gradually uh, go down at that at that moment. So therefore, um, I I still believe that in the short term, near term, the the uh, commodities are still good. Mm. So in that case, you know, I was just discussing a little bit about our Smart Global Max and our Smart Global Ultimax portfolios. Will we be doing any kind of, um, you know, uh, portfolio updates to kind of reflect the current situation? Will we buy more into commodities or perhaps will we uh, buy more into, oh, well, actually not bonds. Bonds are not performing so well. But will there be any shifts and changes within our portfolios itself? Uh, we will, actually we will, uh, it depends on the on the rate hike, the the ultimately the rate hike in in March. Actually, we we are planning to have a, a rebalance this month after the Fed an, uh, announced its plans to uh, plans for a rate hike in this in this month. Around mm -hmm. I, I think around the middle of this month. Middle of this month, so mid March. Uh, so we can, um, any of our users or anyone actually purchasing our Smart Global Max or any of the Smart Global series might see a bit of an update there, correct? Yeah. Uh, what about any of our stock performances? I know that you said that um, Acumon itself holds very little assets um, within Russian stock market, but what do we think about the kind of downward pressure through the supply chain and affecting the other companies that we might actually hold? Uh, actually, right right now for for us for for our 
um, portfolios, I think the biggest risk is, is the uh, shrinking of the liquidity due to the rate hike. And uh, uh, we have two, for example, we have two portfolios. One is called uh, the global um, tech, technology firms and uh, the other one is the Chinese technology firms, right? Mm. Uh, for these two um, portfolios, there are, there are some type of risk for in the, in the short term due to the liquidity shrinkage uh, from the, from the um, Fed and the other, um, the, the other central banks of, the, of the, um, uh, Western countries. But I still feel good for, for the other portfolios. And I guess um, in the next few, in the next few weeks, there, um, although there are some type of risk risks for the for the equity markets globally, uh, I think uh, after the the end of the end of the Russian Ukraine war in the next few weeks, um, there there can be opportunities for for the investors to buy in the equities because we, we as I mentioned the fundamental the Fundamentals for the United States is still good, and uh, um, right now there there is a kind of fear or risk, uh, a type of over risk aversion to towards these these risky assets. Therefore, um, after the end of the war, there, there can be opportunities for these type of risky assets. Mm. So from what I gather there, um, maybe just a, a brief summary is, I guess you're saying um, due to the shrinking liquidity, we're not going to see as many uh, investments or growth in these growth type, type firms such as uh, technology sectors, right? Whereas uh, there are opportunities and the opportunities, what about now currently before the war ends? Are there any opportunities that we should be looking into given that you have a very strong belief in the US uh, markets and the, the core that they have there? Uh, I believe that the the value the value sector can be good for the United States and for the short short term. Of course, the energy sector can be can be good. Uh, however, I, I I do believe that for for kind of long term investors to uh, who are who seek for long term growth in their wealth, uh, maybe do not invest too much in this type of short term speculations. Uh, and uh, it is good for them to uh, diversify their portfolios and uh, invest in a uh, you know, balanced portfolio or a type of uh, global asset allocation portfolio that will be much more robust. Mm -hmm. And so we were just saying <laughs> and, and joking around a little bit then, in that case, should I buy Smart Global Max or should our, our listeners actually buy into Smart Global Ultimax? Like the difference between the two, which one would you recommend? Uh, I think it depends. It depends on the um, um, the type of um, preference actually for uh, for investors who uh, seek, who seek for um, the type of uh, dynamic and uh, um, a kind of um, dynamic um, and. Um, uh, management for the for the asset allocation assets, they it is better for them to invest in the smart global Ultimax. However, for investors who seek for a kind of passive uh, global asset allocation, um, uh, this type of returns, uh, it is good for them to invest in the uh, smart global Max. Mm -hmm. And apart from that, I mean. So we talked about, I think we, we, we briefly touched upon the bond market and due to the rate hikes, you're not looking favorably towards the bond market. Uh, in terms of REITs and property markets, you know, we, we were just cut off in the middle of that before we could get back into it. What are you thinking? Uh, should our investors also look into maybe properties? I think for properties, it is good for properties right now due to the, due to the inflation and the these. Um, properties is definitely a good type of anti-inflation asset. 
Mm. And, and itself, like, would you also recommend to some of us to buy more gold? I know that Smart Global Max actually has some uh, gold um, ETFs, I believe, within the portfolio asset itself. But I know the gold is going up uh, like crazy as well. So the gold prices are rising. Well, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, so for gold, of course, in the, in the short term, if, if the investor, if one of our investor, investors is a um, hyper-speculative investor, it is good for, for him or her to invest in gold. However, for, for a longer term investment, I, I do believe that uh, it is good to, to have a, a kind of balanced portfolio and have limited re, uh, restricted exposure to gold is, is good for, for uh, the investor to have um, a robust return and, uh, and the less volatile volatilities. Mm. Okay. Well, I think that that gives us a pretty good um, wrap up on things that we should be doing. So it's not just all doom and gloom at the moment uh, for investors, despite so much market uncertainty. I think the Ukraine and Russian crisis kind of really casts a strong light on the issue. But ultimately, um, if I can summarize it and feel free to chip in uh, and add on to this. But ultimately, I think right now what the world is focused mostly on is the rate hike itself um and and the consequences of that so ultimately you know we can still invest into the market the market is still strong it's just a lot of uncertain outlooks and a bit of inflation coming through yeah perfect now uh i guess we will just go back into this takeaway um so we we said that War itself is no reason to assume the end of the equity markets and investors should always do long-term goals and diversify and monitor their investments. Um, and as Dr. Lay said, you know, speculation is great. If you want to speculate, uh, if you have that risk appetite, you can speculate into the gold, you can speculate into the commodities, uh, even into the properties. However, ultimately, um, if you're looking for a more hassle-free, robust kind of uh, portfolio that can weather through the storm, then we should be looking at global uh, asset diversifications. Um, and I think secondly, what we were talking about is the fact that the rate hikes is definitely first and foremost something uh, all economists should be concerned about and actually all investors should be looking towards more so than the overshadowing of the war. So with the rate hikes, there will we will have a lack of liquidity, um, previous uh, things that have been running very well, such as the tech stocks, such as crypto that have been booming in the past year or so, those will come to a bit more of a challenging state um, and it's not going to look too optimistic and people who hold a lot of bond as well, you know, um, your returns are not going to be as strong as previously. Now, ultimately, as Acumon, we always say, stay invested for the long term, you know, um, don't put all your eggs in one basket, make sure that you have different investments um, in different pockets, different regions, different industry, so that if one industry gets disrupted, you will still have others to fall back on. And for those who are super, super worried about like retracting from the markets, actually, there's still a lot of opportunities um, abound, you should look for value investments, you know, companies that have strong underlyings that can take the hit, uh, take the uncertainty, and you know a little bit of commodities riding the wave. Is there anything else you would like to add to that, Dr. Lei? Uh, I should say that um, the war actually, um, well, um, everybody actually ex expects that the war will end, end soon because um, um, for the each parties, they do not have they do not want to have a non 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 war, and uh, uh, therefore the impact of this war to the market can be limited in the in the in this year. And we should focus more on the fundamentals of the of the global macroeconomic situations and the, the um, policies such as the red hikes for from the central market and central banks. Mm. Yep. So it does sound like, you know, we are still staying positive despite the chaos that seems to be erupting all around us. Um, so I think this concludes uh, our presentation for today. Uh, we are open to questions. So please feel free to pop your questions into the Q&A box and we can actually get around to that. Uh, let's see our question box for the moment. Uh, oop, okay. Here's one of them. It says, um, 
All right. <laughs> Why should one buy into ETF and robo advisory? You know? <laughs> so, um, one, I think one good reason is that uh, it is convenient for our investors because not everybody, not every investor is sophisticated investor. Um, therefore, um, one, one, one theme or one, uh, one most important advantage for robot advisors is that this type of product is very convenient and uh, um, our investors on, only need to um, have their instructions on, on our app. Um, that is 24 seven and uh, we will um, manage the portfolios for our investors and the investors have, uh, will not take care of the transactions and uh, the, the research of these portfolios. And uh, we will all do all of these for the investors. And I think this is the most important uh, reason, um, one of the most important reason. And the second one is that uh, our performance is good. Mm. Okay, so we have another another few questions. What is Dr. Uh, Lei, actually Dr. Lei's view on Hong Kong property market under the federal uh, interest hike? So how would you think this will affect the Hong Kong property market? I think for the Hong Kong property market, of course the, the interest hike will, will enhance or um, uh, enhance the, the cost for the, or the interest interest cost for the buyers for this market right uh, and uh, this somehow may may slow down the the rise the price right uh, price rise of the of of the hong kong property markets however i uh, we still need to focus on the fundamental of this market and we know that the hong kong um hong kong uh, economic growth is actually strong uh, in the in the recent in the recent periods, uh, especially I, I I believe that after the after this round of uh, Omicron um, pandemic, we will have we will have a much stronger economic growth for Hong Kong, and therefore I still believe that uh, it is good for 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 the investors to hold properties in Hong Kong, and mm. the way. Uh, Another aspect is that is that actually, if you look at the performance of the of the rates in Hong Kong, uh, and compared to the other other securities, right, you will see that in, for twenty twenty one, rates actually performed very good, and uh, uh, for the last few for the last few month, uh, rates rates are also performing. Um, better than the, than the other assets in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I'm glad that you're staying very bullish on uh, properties and the economic growth of Hong Kong. So here we have another question. Uh, it says, should investors change to cash right now or continue to hold on the losing positions? Um, for investors, I do not, I do not suggest uh, that investors to hold cash because we know that we, we are now Facing a very strong inflation and the holding cash is actually a kind of a losing of our wealth. That we will have a kind of a wealth linkage. Therefore, it is better for us to invest in something. However, for because the market is quite volatile, um, when what we should do is to 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 get some certainty. Therefore, diversification is a good way for us to, to guarantee our certainty or the return for our assets. Hmm. And gr granted, to be honest, you know, nobody likes to be in a losing position, right? So what, what, can, is there, are there some, some words of like, I guess, comfort or like, is there anything we can do since we're looking at the, 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 the kind of um, portfolios tank a little bit during this uncertain and volatile time? What, what kind of comments would you give to that? Uh, I still believe that we need to invest long, in a longer term and uh, um, persistent in investing and, uh, and have a kind of optimistic uh, view towards the market. Uh, afterwards, we will have a good result. 
Mm. Especially okay. for this year, because I I still believe that the performance of the of the market is not uh, actually is not con uh, consistent with the uh, macroeconomic foundations. Although we have some fears on the on the macroeconomic foundations due to the war and uh, the inflation, however, we we still we can monitor that the macroeconomic situations for the United States and the the Western countries are good. And for China, it's also good. Mm. So I think, um, granted, you know, sometimes we, we, we would say, is this a good time to top up or is it just a consistent kind of habit that we should have just to top up even when the, the situation is not looking so good? Um, so it's actually, it's a, it's a, I, I think at this moment we 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 can seek for some opportunities to, to pop up. Hmm. Because the markets are low at the moment. Okay. Well, that is yeah. just, you know, a a a what's it called? A <laughs> it's just a suggestion. It's not a recommendation that one ought to. It's a, it's an yeah, opinion. Definitely. Okay. Um, in any case, uh, we do have another question. I'm currently holding Ultimax. Will energy and commodities ETFs be added to the portfolio as a short-term investment? I. Uh, Yes, actually, we are we are looking at uh, for for our monthly rebalance for the for the U.S. portfolios. We will add more energy uh, sector stocks into this portfolio for for March. And this is obviously we're changing up uh, the strategies and rebalancing it around about mid March after the rates come through. Yeah. Perfect. Um, and then I think we have time for, for I think, uh, two more of these questions. They asked, well, if you're only doing the rebalancing in mid-March, would we be losing uh, a lot of opportunities? Actually, um, our rebalances, we have several layers of rebalancing. So for the mid-March rebalancing, which is which I'm talking about is is, uh, is about the asset allocation, assigning weight to different asset classes. However, we, we still have much more dynamic rebalancing within each asset class. For example, for the US portfolios, we will have a monthly rebalance and uh, it, will, it will be done every month. And we'll, that, will, that can be much more timely than the asset allocation, uh, asset allocation rebalance part. And uh, we also have a, a part which is called smart rotation, which um, which monitors the market every day and the six four opportunities and can be rebalanced in a daily basis. Hmm. Got it. All right. I think um, that should be all for the other questions at the moment. Um, anyone else have any last final says? If not, uh, we are happy to conclude um, today's webinar a little ahead of schedule. Um, should you guys actually uh, have any other further you know, queries or you wanna learn more about the products, um, any of our participants today will actually receive a $200 kind of um, complimentary account opening reward. So feel free to download the app and give it a try. Um, as Dr. Lei was saying, this is perhaps a, a good opportunity to seek out some value investments. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us here at Acumon today to learn more about the Ukraine-Russia crisis. And I hope you guys had some valuable takeaways. Uh, we will send you the recap on email as well as some key takeaways and um, any of these exclusive offers that you can also join. So once again, thank you so much, Dr. Lei, for joining us today. Uh, and thank you for everybody here. Thank you, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Have a great one, guys.